It's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host, David Feldman. Hello, David. Hello, everybody. And the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello. The program is going to challenge the intelligence of our very intelligent audience. That is correct. And we're going to kick off by telling you that, well, if you don't know by now, Northern California is on fire. A lot of climate change action has stalled during the pandemic, but climate change hasn't stopped because of coronavirus. In fact, it's exacerbating our other crises. Our first guest, Robert H. Frank, has some ideas to help with the climate crisis. He says that peer pressure is the most powerful influencer and social pressures to live bigger have accelerated climate change. But he has ideas about how to use peer pressure as a force for positive change. He wrote a book about this called Under the Influence, Putting Peer Pressure to Work. In it, he plies the lessons we have learned from how, as a culture, we were able to reduce dramatically the number of people who smoke cigarettes to how we can reduce our carbon emissions. We'll hear more about that in the first part of our show today. In the second part, we'll talk about coronavirus. And this is actually some good news for a change. There might be a solution to this crisis, finally, and it will only cost between $1 and $5 a day per person. The proposed solution is to have cheap at-home frequent COVID tests. The idea being that everyone in the U.S. would take a test every day and we could catch contagious people before they spread coronavirus. Our second guest, Michael Minna, is calling for this solution. He is an epidemiologist and physician at Harvard and says frequent testing like this could have the same effect as a vaccine. And it is certainly our fastest way of resuming some sort of normal. This could be brought into reality within a few weeks. So we'll hear more from Michael Mina about this in the second part of the show. In between, we, as always, have some time to check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. But first, let's talk about the power of peer pressure. David? Robert H. Frank is the H.J. Lewis Professor of Management and Professor of Economics at Cornell University's Johnson Graduate School of Management. For more than a decade, his Economic View column appeared monthly in the New York Times. He has published on a variety of topics, including price and wage discrimination and public utility pricing. Dr. Frank is a New York Times bestselling author. His books include The Winner Take All Society, The Economic Naturalist, and Success and Luck. His most recent book is Under the Influence, Putting Peer Pressure to Work. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Robert H. Frank. Thanks, David. Welcome indeed, Robert. When I was growing up, my mother would take notice of certain bad behaviors by my classmates or bad talk, and she would say to me, turn your back on the pack. Very rarely would she say, join the pack for good behavior or good talk. And in your book, you indicated that peer group pressure often is more frequently not good than good. Before we get into the climate disruption analysis in your book, why is it among youngsters, the peer pressure is more toward bad behavior and bad talk and not good behavior and good talk? And in your book, you seem to extrapolate that through all ages. Yeah, it's not limited to young people, Ralph. It's something that we see among people of all ages, but that's not to say that the example of good behavior has no impact. It, it has a, a very powerful impact to that too. A symmetry between the negative and the positive influences has been attributed by some to the fact that when we think about doing something that we know others don't approve of, we look for excuses or license to do it. When we see others doing it, that makes it easier for us to take the same step. When we, on the other hand, think about doing something that we know everybody approves of, we don't need any social approval for that. We know we can do that without fear of anybody chastising us for doing it. And so we're less dependent upon peer approval to take good acts. But the fact that we see other people doing socially useful things makes us more likely to do them, very much so. You make the point in your book that when uh, people start putting solar panels in a neighborhood on their roof, there's a second order beneficial effect beyond X number of houses putting up solar panels. Can you explain yeah, that? that? 
That's a great example. And to call it a second order effect makes it sound minor when in fact the indirect effect of what you do is vastly bigger than the direct effect. So according to the seminal study in this area, which took place early in the solar adoption cycle in California, if one additional family put up a rooftop installation on its house, then within four months time, the authors estimated, there would be a copycat installation in that same neighborhood. They have ways of ruling out whether the second installation is one that would have occurred anyway, independently of the first one. So the second one is a copycat. Then after another four months pass, each of those two installations spawns a copycat yet again. So after eight months, we've got not two installations, but four. And what if you follow that out, after only two years time, that first installation results in 32 solar installations just in that neighborhood. But that's just the beginning because each of those people is in contact with friends and relatives who live in other places. And we know from other evidence that conversations between relatives and friends have much more influence than the examples set by neighbors. So the fact of your taking that step early in the process has orders of magnitude larger effects if we count in all the other people who were influenced to behave in a similar way. It's a huge multiplier effect. If that's so, why hasn't it spread throughout the country much, much faster, although it is a major industry now, especially in California, rooftop solar panels? If there's such a multiplier effect, why isn't it spread much faster? It is spreading very fast. Here in upstate New York, where we have a heavy cloud cover much of the year, it's not the ideal location for solar installations. The main solar installation business is way behind schedule. They can't keep up with the orders. Many people wanted to install solar panels and were told they weren't good candidates. We tried to install some several years ago and were told that our roof orientation and the trees on the property made us a bad candidate to do it. And so it was only last year we learned that we were candidates to become part owners in a solar farm, which was actually a much more attractive arrangement than putting the panels on our rooftop. So we've done that now. And, and so we are consuming the rest of the lifetime we're in this house. Well, let's go a little deeper on this. The nature of the contagion is very interesting. A lot of people you talk to who put solar panels on their roof are either persuaded by the advertising and the marketing by the vendors and or they think they're going to save money and be self-reliant and not be dependent on uncertain sources of supply. Now you say there's a third factor, and that is the proverbial neighbor is doing it. Let's talk about the nature of that third factor's contagion. Is it because they know the neighbor personally? Or they just hear about it four blocks away or what? <laughs> That's a great question. And I think it's good to reflect on why seeing what other people do has such a strong effect on us. And I think ultimately a big part of the picture has to be that it's a very uncertain and complicated world out there. I don't know very much of what I would need to know to, to navigate through it successfully. Neither do you, neither does any other individual. But we know, at least intuitively, that collectively, the people as a whole out there have a lot of experience and knowledge. And so when we see people confidently taking some action and seeming to know what they're doing, if you didn't at least have a strong impulse to say to yourself, I ought to investigate whether I should be doing that too, you probably would be ill-equipped to make your way in the world at all, I think so. The idea that there's a lot of information that you could profit by learning if you watched what other people do carefully is it's got to be a deep idea that we don't think about much, but is, is a powerful driver of our behavior. I was asked once, what was the best example I could cite of behavioral contagion? And I thought immediately of a scene I had seen in an Alan Funt film. You're old enough to know who he is. Your listeners may not know. He was the impresario of Candid Camera the long-running show where he would put people in odd situations and film what they did. Well, he, he announced a great job, no hard re requirements, great salary, short hours. Of course, many people wanted to apply for it. He invited candidates in to interview, and a candidate shows up. We see him arrive. He's ushered into a room where four other people are seated, waiting. 
the candidate doesn't know it, but we, the viewer, know that they're confederates of Alan Funt. The film keeps coming back to them, nothing's happening. And then we, we get a close up of the new arrival's face turning from passive indifference to sudden alarm. The camera pans back and we see that the reason he's alarmed is that the other four have at no apparent signal stood up and are taking off all their clothing. He gets more and more agitated looking as he watches this. Then you can see him flip. A look of calm comes back over his, his face. He too stands and he begins taking off his own clothing and the scene ends with all five of them standing there naked, waiting for some sign about what to do next. And you think, no way would I do that. That was my thought anyway, when I saw that. But then I reflected for a moment. I said, well, I've already got a job I like. I don't need a much better job than the one I have. These four, if anybody knows what the next step is, it's they, because they got there before I did. They think it's worth taking the next step. Would it be so irrational to conclude that it might be worth doing that too, just to see how it plays out? I'm not, I'm not willing to indict him for doing that. So it's a powerful impulse. And when we see people putting solar panels on their rooftops, that plays into that same impulse. Well, let's get to the nub of your book, which is basically to provide tax incentives for prior proper behavior, both socially across the country in the aggregate and individually. And you had an article in the New York Times a few days ago where you made the argument for a carbon tax. And of course, you acknowledged critics who think that that's not going to work because you'll never get enough of a carbon tax, big enough, accepted. And there are ways that the companies can reduce other costs and not keep the price of fossil fuels high because of a carbon tax. So why don't you state your case for a carbon tax? And then I want to give you examples where mandates, regulatory mandates, solve the problem without a tax. Sure. And I'll say at the outset, Ralph, that if we had only a carbon tax, that would not produce the kind of changes we need to see happen on the time scale we need to see them happen in. If we had had a carbon tax 50 years ago, I think that may have been the only measure we would have needed to adopt to avert the warming process we've seen unfold during those decades. But it's too late for that, that to happen now. But even so, a carbon tax in combination with other policies that we do need to adopt too, I think would make us arrive at carbon neutrality much, much faster and with much higher probability. So, so the idea is fairly simple. The reason we put carbon into the air in the first place is that it costs money to filter it out. And the governments around the world have permitted us to dump it into the air for free. So of course, rational businesses will just dump it as long as that's the terms of the deal. If you charge people for putting those emissions into the air, suddenly, overnight, they get creative about finding all sorts of efficient ways to filter them out, ways they had never thought of before. And we know that's true because of the example with the SO2 permit process. When I came to Cornell in the 1970s, all I read about was acid rain. It was killing the forests. It was killing the fish in the lakes. We didn't see a day pass without more evidence of the destruction it caused. And it was all from H2S, hydrogen sulfide, being emitted from smokestacks in the Midwest from high sulfur coal. It would blow east and, and rain down on us as H2SO4, sulfuric acid. The moment we started requiring tradable permits for that, and it took 30 years for Congress to act, that problem went away virtually overnight at about one-sixth the cost of direct regulatory intervention was estimated to take to solve it. It was solved much quicker and much more cheaply when we gave firms a strong incentive to figure out ways to cut back. So that's the case for carbon taxation. And the case is much stronger than the traditional case exactly because of the contagion multiples that we talked about up front. So if, if making coal-fired electric generators more expensive relative to solar and wind generation. A carbon tax induces me to put a solar panel on my rooftop. It's not just my action that we got to count as a benefit of having done that. It's the actions of those 32 copycat installations we're going to see in two years' time and all the others that we're going to see 
expanding from networks of friends and relatives that we all have in other places. So, so yeah, the, the carbon tax, I think if it had been sold properly, it would have been attractive to virtually the whole population. You know, we would call first for a revenue neutral design, taking all the revenue, most of which would come from rich people since they use most of the energy. The key feature in advocating a carbon tax is to make it revenue neutral. What that means is that you collect all the revenue from the carbon tax, most of which would come from wealthy individuals since uh, worldwide, the top 10% of the income distribution emits 50% of all carbon emissions. They'd pay in most of the revenue, give the revenue back to people in progressive fashion so that low and middle income families would get the revenue checks each month that would be bigger than the amount they'd paid in carbon taxes. So as many as 90% of all families would get back more each month than they'd pay in. The wealthy would pay in more than they got back, but they too would be net beneficiaries because they'll have to shoulder most of the tax burden for climate mitigation measures in the future. It's win, 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 win. There's just well, absolutely no reason to oppose it. Let's elaborate that a bit. And listeners should know that Exxon Mobil has come out in favor of a carbon tax, which has raised some suspicions <laughs> yeah, among that... skeptics. Maybe uh, I want where, to rethink. Where exactly will the tax be imposed? At the well? The it's... gas oil well? The coal mine? And the second question that's related is, if gasoline now sells for $2.25 a gallon, under your plan, how much would the motorist have to pay for it? The carbon tax proposals come in all stripes. The most widely circulated version imposes the tax on the fuel where it's extracted from the earth or where it's imported into the country. There are other ways to do it besides that. The size of the carbon tax is a policy question. I think the argument is to make it as big as we can politically achieve because if it's revenue neutral, we don't have to worry about it being a burden for families. It won't make it harder for them to make ends meet. All it will do is make goods with high carbon footprints more expensive relative to goods with low carbon footprints. It will induce people to shift from one to the other, and they'll have plenty of money to meet all the needs that they need to meet each month because their budgets will be bigger rather than smaller. So I would say if you have a choice, big or small, on the carbon tax, go big. Are you talking about 10% of the value of the oil at the well, 20, 30, 40%? The papers say yesterday a barrel of oil is coming in at $42.50. I don't know what a ton of coal is coming in, but give some percentage to our listeners. One early IPCC estimate said that a tax that would double the price of gasoline at the U.S. would be sufficient to get to climate stability over the next couple of decades. I think the news that we've received on the climate front in the meantime has been pessimistic. That's probably not enough under current estimates. But suppose it were double or even triple the current price of gasoline. What we know is that in many countries around the world, gasoline is already double or triple what we pay at the pump. And what we know too is that automobile manufacturers have responded in those countries by producing cars that get 50, 60, 70 miles per gallon. That's just with current technology. They've just begun to really get to work in earnest at developing new technologies. And of course, in the end, we're going to be powering cars, not with gasoline, but with electricity generated from solar and wind, which means there won't be any carbon tax to pay on, on that at all. So, so yeah, I think go big. But in those countries like Western Europe, where gasoline is at least twice as expensive to the motorist as it is in this country, they don't rebate. They use that yeah. money to, to build public transit, renovate their roads, bridges. Why rebate? Europe does spend the revenue from its carbon taxes on infrastructure and other public goods, and those are very productive uses of that revenue. Here, we have not been able to convince the population to adopt a carbon tax. So important is that goal that I recommend a revenue neutral carbon tax, just because it would make unambiguously clear that the carbon tax measure viewed in isolation would be a winning option for virtually every taxpayer.
we would have to then turn to other sources of revenue. And the theory of behavioral contagion makes clear that we should be taxing only activities that cause harm to others. And once you see how the social environment influences us to do things that harm other people, it immediately becomes clear that we could raise all the revenue we need to fund even the most expansive version of a modern state by taxing only activities that cause harm to other people. Yeah, otherwise known often as sin taxes, taxes on tobacco, taxes on alcohol. And Those would be examples, but there are many, many other examples that aren't normally thought of in that way. True. This is where I want to get into where mandates have worked. Barry Commoner, the late great environmentalist, used to say, you want to control pollution? Prevent it. Once you start incrementally regulating it, you invite all the lobbyists to game the system and overpower the regulator. So in 1978, the U.S. finally, after a graduated process, banned the manufacture of lead in house-based paint. And in 1996, after a graduated process, the U.S. government banned tetraethyl lead in gasoline. And subsequently, Tests by medical people have shown that Americans now have less lead in their blood. Would you have done it by taxation, or would you favor what actually happened? I think those prohibitions were exactly the right way to attack each of those problems. All right, let's talk about seatbelts. When seatbelts were introduced, they were voluntarily used, and it reached about 20% of the motorists, and it just stagnated there. And when the federal mandate came in on seatbelts, it didn't take long for usage to go to 70%, 75%. And I think contagion took over, especially with truck drivers. It's now about 90% wherever it's mandated. I like the mandate there too. Okay. Let's take asbestos, which before it was regulated was estimate to have killed 250,000 Americans from World War II on, starting in the shipyards, where the workers would come home with their overhauls loaded with asbestos dust and adversely affect their own family. They didn't know that at the time, but the companies did. And for many uses in this country, asbestos is now prohibited, banned. How would you have handled that with your tax approach, or would you prefer what actually occurred? There, too, a ban was the right step. A tax approach is one that I like as a general matter. It's not an absolute that applies in all cases. Think about the question of how we get people to change their diets. Would it be better to tell people as of January 1st, you're no longer permitted to eat meat by law? Or might we want to take a slightly gentler approach to achieving the very laudable goal of reducing meat consumption in the country? I heard Cory Booker interviewed. He was asked why he didn't recommend that people become vegan, as he had done, rather than instead recommending to them that they eat less meat. And his response was illuminating. He said that if he recommended that people become vegan, Hardly anybody would follow his recommendation. Many people would bitterly resist it. If he recommended that they eat a little less meat, well, people already know they ought to be eating a little less meat and hearing one more person in an influential position say it might cause meat consumption to go down by 5%. What I like about the carbon tax as a way to discourage climate dangerous dietary choices is that there's a very strong social component to what we eat. I I grew up eating meat because I was around people who did. Most of my friends eat meat. If I serve a a vegetarian meal, there's at least some concern that people think I'm being a cheapskate, not, not showing respect for my guests. If meat were much more expensive relative to plant-based foods, We know that some people would shift away from meat and towards plant-based foods, not entirely, but that would make it the custom to eat differently and that it would be easier for others to do likewise. And when they shifted their behavior, others would change too. And in very short order, we would see a huge swing in dietary choices. And I think we're much more likely to adopt the measure in that case than if we 
tried to take the hair shirt approach by trying to pass a law banning meat. That's not going to get us there. What I sense what you're doing is you're carefully calibrating levels of popular resistance or acceptance depending on the kinds of products. And I think that's a pretty intelligent way to approach it. One interesting point you make on page 262, let me quote, and you say the following. This relates to climate disruption. I don't like the term climate change. It was coined by a Republican wordsmith in 2002 to replace a more alarming phrase, global warming. Unfortunately, the Democrats lapped it up like a cat laps up milk. So anyway, let's talk about climate catastrophe or climate crisis. And you say the following. We will also need bold changes in public policy, but studying the power of behavioral contagion has persuaded me that conscious consumption may promote progress on the policy front in ways I had not previously appreciated. Installing solar panels, buying an electric vehicle, or adopting a more climate-friendly diet doesn't just increase the likelihood of others taking similar steps. It also deepens one's sense of identity as a climate advocate. In the process, it increases one's likelihood of support candidates who favor strong climate legislation and of knocking on doors to help them get elected, end quote. In other words, you move from the consumer to the civic advocacy arena. Yes. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I was in league with most of my fellow economists in believing for most of my career that individual actions, like the ones you listed, while they were good and would be good if everyone took them, since they were expensive and wouldn't by themselves have any measurable impact, very few people would take them. And in the absence of sterner policy measures to get the, to the goals we wanted to achieve, we wouldn't get anywhere with that approach. And I've, I've changed my mind about that, not just because of the indirect effects of individual actions, which we talked about early in our conversation, but also because I've rejected the standard economic assumption that we come into the world with fixed identities and preferences. That's not the way life works. We, we gradually become who we are. This was really Aristotle's main line of thinking. In the process of living our lives, our habits deepen, we become who we are. And so when you incur costs, costs that you have every reason to think are yours to pay and won't by themselves affect the overall picture significantly, that makes you almost by definition into more of a champion for whatever the cause is you're incurring those costs on behalf of. You're conveying the contagion that can be described as practicing what you preach. Yes. You become what you do. And if you can't become a person who consumes as if the planet's fate hung in the balance without feeling an impulse to vote for politicians who behave as if they agree with you. And it doesn't take much to change things here. You know, look at Virginia last year. Last year, both houses of the state legislature flipped there. Virginia is not a radical hotbed state. And this year, just a few months ago, and last year, Virginia enacted the most ambitious decarbonization legislation of any state. We have candidates on the ballot who care about the climate. There are others who, who are not willing to take action. It's going to be a project to get out and vote and make sure your vote counts. But if you care about the climate and you're taking actions on behalf of it, you're much more likely to bear those costs. Well, you're one of the founders of the behavioral economics movement, which has always amused me because we had to deal early on with economists who monetized everything. And you couldn't get them to talk about consumer irrationality, consumer non-maximization of their utility, so to speak. Yeah. And the consumer groups kept putting out reports, putting out studies, litigating, getting good factual judicial decisions, legislation. And these economists would never pay any attention. They, they sort of looked down on consumer economics the way they looked down on home economics in courses in community colleges. Mm -hmm. So I'm very glad that you were a pioneer in this area, Professor Frank. But it is interesting that the Nobel Prizes are now being given out more and more to behavioral economists who see a qualitative dimension to their work, not just supply-demand curves 
and knee-jerk approaches like that of Milton Friedman, one of the most overrated economists in American history. Well, we're out of time, and I just want to say there are hundreds of thousands of little neighborhood book clubs in this country, and they have this atrocious rule, 90% of them, that they only deal with fiction because they don't want to deal with nonfiction and have controversy. Well, let me tell you, if you're a member of a neighborhood book club, it's healthy controversy and healthy discussion to take up and adopt Robert Frank's book, Under the Influence, Putting Peer Pressure to Work. Thank you very much, Robert Frank. Thank you, Ralph. We've been speaking with economist Robert H. Frank. We will link to his new book at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Let's take a short break. When we return, we're going to talk to epidemiologist Michael Minna about new possibilities with COVID-19 testing. But first, let's check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, August 28, 2020. I'm Russell Mokhyber. The Justice Department has charged Teva Pharmaceuticals with conspiring to fix prices, rig bids, and allocate customers for generic drugs. On May 7th, Apotex admitted to its role in the conspiracy and agreed to pay $24.1 million dollars. On July 14th, a grand jury returned an indictment against Glenmark for its role in the same conspiracy. Teva, Glenmark, Apotex, and unnamed co-conspirators agreed to increase prices for pravastatin and other generic drugs. Pravastatin is a commonly prescribed cholesterol medication that lowers the risk of heart disease and stroke. Five previous corporate cases were resolved by deferred prosecution agreements, and Teva's co-conspirator, Glenmark, is awaiting trial. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman and Ralph. Currently, going to get tested for coronavirus is an ordeal. It takes hours, and it's not working as a public health strategy. About nine out of every 10 coronavirus cases aren't even being caught. But what if you could test yourself at home every day, and it took just a few minutes? Our next guest will tell us more about this possibility. David? Dr. Michael Minna is an epidemiologist, immunologist, and physician. He's an assistant professor of epidemiology at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health, as well as a core member of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics. Dr. Minna's research combines mathematical and epidemiological models to better understand the patterns of infectious disease in our population. His research also explores questions of immunity. Dr. Minna is currently advocating for a shift towards cheap daily coronavirus tests for everybody. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Dr. Michael Minna. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome indeed. And just to frame it a bit for our listener, Dr. Minna, I want to just quote from a very long article that just came out in The Atlantic. And they described you as a professor of epidemiology at Harvard who studies diagnostic testing of infectious diseases. And I'm quoting now. He has watched with disgust and disbelief as the United States has struggled for months to obtain enough tests to fight the coronavirus. Tests permit us to do the most basic task in disease control. Identify the sick and separate them from the well. When tests are abundant, they can dispel the fear of contagion that has quieted public life. And to continue, a couple more sentences. They quote you as saying at the end of March, quote, there's little ability for a central command unit to pool all the resources from around the country. We have no way to centralize things in this country short of declaring martial law, end quote. And then the Atlantic continues saying, it took several more months for Dr. Minna to find a solution to this problem, which is to circumvent it altogether. In the past several weeks, he's become an evangelist for a total revolution in how the U.S. controls this pandemic. Instead of restructuring daily life around the American way of testing, he argues, the country should build testing into the American way of life, end quote. Can you elaborate that? Absolutely. So the the beginning was really focused on, there were a lot of questions early on, why why isn't the U.S. where it needs to be with testing? Why was China able to get testing scaled up so quickly? Why was South Korea able to? 
And one of the major reasons early on is that the approach that we have taken thus far to testing is to have the tests be performed in centralized laboratories. But essentially to do this with, with the way that our FDA process works, every laboratory that wanted to begin testing was essentially reinventing the wheel. You could have labs one block apart from each other and both would have to be doing the exact same test, but they would have to both be sort of reinventing the wheel, getting the whole test setup started from scratch and going to the FDA and applying for applications to actually perform the test. And this was a, a real departure from what, what other countries were able to do, which was truly centralize and use economy of scale to get testing up and going quickly. And we just had no ability because, you know, just the, the way that our country is fractured into states alone makes it almost impossible to actually use the economy of scale and bring all of these different tests together and, and sort of create massive assembly lines, if you will, to, to really gain efficiencies. And so that, that was sort of the, the whole beginning of all of this. And now I've been really advocating for a whole different type of test, which is essentially to distribute the test. Don't funnel them through these individual laboratories, put them in people's hands in their houses and, and allow them to test themselves to know their own transmission status so that they can then make good choices about whether or not they go out or whether or not they go into that nursing home, for instance, or that school. And this is one way with a, with a virus that spreads as quickly as the coronavirus, just the mere fact of having to send in a swab to a laboratory puts an immediate 24-hour delay in getting results. In that period of time, somebody could go and create a super spreading event and, and infect 30 other people. I've been very strongly advocating for a whole different approach, and that is to distribute the tests in the same way that we have pregnancy tests can be picked up over the counter, for example and people know how to use them responsibly, we would have the same thing with these types of tests where you, you go to your local CVS or Walgreens or the federal government provides you with the test or whatever it might be. And, and everyone uses one of these every day or two to ensure that they are not transmitting virus before they walk out of their house. And these are paper strip tests of saliva. So you can do it at home. Is that correct? That's correct. There's actually the, the saliva. It could also be a nasal swab, but, but a swab that just goes in the front part of your nose that you can do by yourself with essentially a Q-tip. So the saliva or the anterior nares swab, the, those are both collection methods that can be done by yourself at home. And then exactly right. These are essentially paper strip tests. They might look just like a pregnancy test if you were to pull a lot of the plastic off of it, for example. And they actually do the same thing when you would put the saliva onto it and a red line will show up if it's positive and, a, and no line will show up if it's negative, for instance. So they can be made very, very cheaply and very easily. And you can get it in your local pharmacy store? Well, that's the idea. That's what I would really like to do. Right now, there's a lot of federal oversight of these products. And there's this concern that people can't be trusted with their own results. And so, so there, there is this sort of unwillingness but at the federal level and public health laboratories to necessarily let go of that control. But, you know, people said the same thing about masks early on. They pretty much said if it wasn't a perfect mask, people can't be trusted to make the right decisions. And if they didn't have a perfect mask, they would have poor behavior of thinking that they were more secure than they are. Well, now we all know that everyone should wear a mask regardless of just how, you know, if it's a not a great mask or a perfect mask, everyone should wear a mask, whatever they have. And that's the same thing with these tests is they're not going to be as good as the laboratory-based tests, but if we can get them into everyone's hands and we can trust that the average person will make the right decisions about it, then we can actually have some flexibility with some people who choose not to use it at all. That's, that's not a huge problem. Uh, so if you, you wake carried. up one morning and you use the test, you test yourself, you come out positive, what happens? If you test yourself, you come out positive, maybe then you pull out in the same box of 30 tests, maybe it will have five what we call confirmatory tests. And that's because you want to make sure that it's not a false positive. So you, you then put some saliva on one of the confirmatory tests. And if they're both positive, then you stay home. And if you're not symptomatic and you're not ill, we know a lot of people don't feel any symptoms from this virus, you stay home and you self-quarantine. You keep yourself away from other people. If you start to feel ill, then maybe you go to the doctor or you call up the doctor and ask what to do. And ideally, these tests would also come maybe with a website and you log in. If you're positive, you log in to let your local public health department know that you're positive. But it would be essentially voluntary. It wouldn't be mandated. And we would bank on the majority of people 
choosing to do that. And you say you actually wrote an article in the New York Times with a economist, Professor Kotlikoff yep. from Boston University, and it was printed on July 3rd, 2020 for listeners who want to retrieve it in the New York Times. It's called A Cheap, Simple Way to Control the Coronavirus. And you mentioned some manufacturers, some small companies that are in the late stages of developing these paper strips and other simple daily COVID-19 tests. But you're also quoted as saying that if your plan is instituted nationwide, it could bring the virus to heel in the U.S. in about a month. You still stick with that prediction? I do. And so if we were to, let's say we start with hotspots, places where the virus is spreading quickly right now. If we were to roll these tests out and get them into the hands of, say, even just half of the, the individuals in a, in a given community or a town, and most people who receive them use them every one to three days, it doesn't have to be every single day, you would very quickly see a turnover of the virus where cases would start to plummet. And this is because the effect would not be an individual level effect, meaning the real benefit of these types of what I call transmission indicating tests isn't just to give you an information about yourself. And that's why I make the distinction that these aren't a diagnostic, a medical diagnostic test. The real benefit here of getting these out to so many people and having them use them frequently is that we actually sever transmission chains. We stop and, and, and it's that act of stopping a transmission chain at sort of a main branch before it splinters out to create 10 more transmission chains is how we stop epidemics. And so it doesn't need to be 100% of people. It doesn't even need to be the vast majority. It just needs to be, say, 50% in the same way that vaccines only have to achieve immunity in about 50% of people. And we will see a big drop in, in the overall amount of virus in the population. These tests would essentially do the same thing, only it wouldn't be working by eliciting a strong immune response to stop the transmission from moving forward if somebody gets infected. It's giving people information about their status so that they can stop the transmission willingly by staying home. And so I do believe that within weeks, if these could be introduced into any given population, that that population could get the virus under control. Well, the crisis is only worsening. I mean, just to compare it, listeners, the crisis of the coronavirus pandemic started in China and spread around the world. China imposed very serious controls. They claim 5,000 deaths. In the United States, it's just about 180,000 deaths. China has four times the population of the U.S. Trump has made a colossal disaster out of the federal response undermining scientists, substituting his quackery, scoffing and delaying for weeks earlier this year, which allowed the multiplier effect to occur, and in all kinds of ways, creating a nightmare for the American people. A thousand people a day are dying from this virus as we speak. And to make matters worse, he's corrupting science. The FDA just said that people can use a plasma and it would cure a third of the coronavirus patients. The Centers for Disease Control, which is being politicized and the scientists undermined, just changed their guidance and said that asymptomatic people don't have to be tested. What do you think of all that, doctor? I think it's, it's an abomination. It's, you know, politicizing an epidemic will help nobody, including the base that is voting for Trump in this case, you know, whatever the, the group is that's politicizing it. In this case, one of the most harmful things that we can possibly do to Americans right now is bring politics into our approaches to, to fight this virus. This virus does not care. It doesn't care who you are, be it with regard to anything really but your age. It doesn't care what political side of the spectrum you're on. And, the, you know, any inefficiency and any unwillingness to work together to fight this is just it just sets us back so far. We are, we are not just the laughing stock of the world with regard to our response to this virus, but we are in a position to, you know, we, we have been in the best position to potentially fight this virus, and we very quickly squandered all of it for various reasons, many of which have been just political incompetence and unwillingness to work as a single unit to actually 
fight this. And, and we will continue to just drag our feet, apparently. And every day that we do that, more Americans continue to die. There are solutions on the table right now that we could be grabbing and using, and we are going the exact opposite direction. And, you know, I wish that I could say that, for example, the CDC guidance to stop testing asymptomatic people was for a logical reason. And I, I actually gave them the benefit of the doubt for a few minutes today, thinking maybe it was actually because they were taking certain supply chain considerations into uh, supply chain issues into consideration. But turns out it wasn't. It was a pressure campaign from above. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this will kill people, unfortunately, you know, willingly or not. We've proposed legislation in Congress to establish a COVID-19 commission under the National Institutes of Health to take the place of the Trump-Pence boondoggle and operate with pandemic scientists and managers the federal government's response and its relation to the states to curtail the pandemic virus. And there hasn't been any pickup yet on Capitol Hill. It's basically a widespread consensus that Trump and Pence should step aside and let pandemic scientists and managers manage this horrific pandemic crisis. And I had a retired pollster say, if that was polled, you'd have 90% of the people supporting Trump and Pence step aside, even Trump voters, because they know he's bungling. They know he's a quack in this area. Do you think they should step aside in favor of something like a corona pandemic commission under NIH? Oh, absolutely. I think that there are, you know, I could right off the top of my head name a dozen people who could easily lead such a commission with much greater outcomes and better outcomes. And you know what? It, they'd be smart to do it because right now all of what goes wrong is falling on Pence and Trump. And so they just continue to make worse and worse decisions because they continue to try to cover up how bad the response has been. And, you know, the, this could have gone one of two ways. It could have been a spectacular win for this administration. We could have worked together. He could have actually taken leadership. And part of that, in my very strong opinion, would have been stepping aside as being having his very close administration being in charge because they are not scientists. They don't know the, the nuances of and the, and the necessary the ramifications of each decision that they're making and how it might have ripple effects across an epidemic like this. There, there's a reason why people get PhDs in these types of issues. And, you know, we need policymakers in place. But first and foremost, we need, we need scientists to be calling the shots in terms of what are the right approaches to take. And we just haven't seen, unfortunately, much of that at all. And, and when scientists do come in with good solutions, they generally have been pushed aside for people like Pence or Kushner. Well, there's been one criticism that you need to address for your proposal, and you've heard it many times, and that is that the strip type test is less accurate, but it's much more frequent. And the frequency makes up for the less accuracy compared to the traditional tests that people are taking in hospitals and clinics and have to wait days to get a result. Can you just summarize that response to someone who has raised it? Absolutely. So the, this is a little bit of a confusing point, but I, I actually would say that it, it's not so much that these are less accurate. Accuracy depends on what your target is. And there's an important thing that's, I don't have enough time to really go into detail, but PCR, the type of testing that most people are using, will, will pick people up as positive long after they've actually been infected with the virus and long after they have been for weeks, potentially, after somebody is no longer transmitting the virus. So that's good if you're a physician trying to get every shred of evidence to understand what's going wrong with your patient. But if this is being used, for example, as a transmission indicating tool in the wider population, we don't actually want to know who was infected two weeks ago. We want to know who is infected right now. And specifically, we want to know who is able to transmit the virus right now. And if that's the target, then these tests are very accurate. They will be able to tell you if you are potentially transmitting the virus. They won't necessarily be sufficiently sensitive to tell you if you have minute amounts of virus in you. But people don't transmit, when, for example, when the virus is at um, 10 particles per milliliter in your, in your nasal passage. It, it transmits when it's at a million or a billion particles. So these tests will definitely pick people up 
when they have such a high viral load that they can transmit. And so I think it needs to be clarified that as a diagnostic tool, they are less accurate, but as a transmission indicating tool, they do the job very well and they let you know when you are infectious. And that is what that is actually what these things need to do at the community level. They don't need to tell you if you were infected two weeks ago. That would throw a lot of people off in terms of how they respond to it. We want to just know who's infected now and who's able to transmit now and ask them to stay home those days. And so I would say that unfortunately, the whole accuracy issue has gotten a little bit confused in the media, but I would say these are actually quite accurate for the task at hand. And as many scientists have said, a PCR test that takes 10 days to get the result from is useless. Isn't that correct? That's, that's exactly right. I mean, I think, you know, especially as a public health tool, it, it's both the, the, a PCR test that takes 10 days to get it, it even takes four days to get the result back is useless because most people, their infectious window is going to be actually quite short. They're going to be primarily infecting others for just three to five days, not not much more than that. So a four-day window to get results back is a terrible loss, even a three-day window. you know. So it, it gets better as you get down to one day, but none of it's as good as a few minutes. But the other big, the really big thing is that if you are testing people infrequently, which if we're being honest, we can't get PCR-based testing, laboratory-based testing, there's not enough labs in the country to really test the populace on a very frequent basis, like every three days. So if we are doing infrequent testing with a very sensitive test like PCR, people will say, well, that's good because you know we need PCR because we need to catch people early in their infection. Well, the point is, if we're testing people infrequently, then just the chances of actually taking the swab out of somebody's nose on a day when they are early in their infection is very low. You're very unlikely to even test anyone on that day anyway. And so that's why frequency becomes so much more important than the actual analytical sensitivity of these tests. And if you're not doing frequent testing, you're just not going to catch people early on before they start spreading it to others. And so it's, it's why it becomes, I would say in terms of priority, we should put frequency first, and then the turnaround time to get the test should be very close second. And things like sensitivity should be, as long as it does the job to catch people when they're spreading, the molecular sensitivity of it can be a, a distant third. And how can this be implemented nationwide? What else has to be done? You have to start with a congressional hearing, the FDA, the media. How do you turn it around from an idea and a proposal into a widespread application? Yeah, so we've, we're doing it slowly. We've been talking to a lot of policymakers, senators, governors, congressmen, and women. And then we've been meeting with the CDC, the NIH. We just had a what I thought was a pretty positive meeting yesterday with the FDA. And it has to be, I think I would like to see it happen quickly, but I think it needs to, uh, you know, short of that, it needs to happen methodically. And we need to kind of lay out the, the groundwork and the evidence for why this approach will work. The FDA is a entity that when it comes to testing, they are only familiar with the idea of, of evaluating medical diagnostic tests. And so they're not used to this idea of, diagn- of evaluating a test that is going to have a primary purpose of stopping transmission at the population level. And so it, it is going to take a little bit of effort to get them to, to get the FDA to understand that these types of tests need to be evaluated differently. And it's conversations like the one we had yesterday with the FDA to really lay out the idea and get a feeling for where they're at in terms of how willing they are going to be to evaluate these in a new light, not a non-diagnostic, but a public health light. And I think we're, we're going in that direction. So the next steps are going to be, we need to get some of the companies that are able to make these to create a sufficient number of them so that we can do some pilot studies, gather even more data. We, we have a lot of data to theoretically say, yes, this is going to work. But the FDA always wants the real empirical data, which is hard for these because these are public health efforts. It's, it's hard to show herd effects, for example, or population level effects with, you know, before they're, the product is actually being fully marketed. Uh, but I think we're, we're going to set up some pilot studies and it's just going to be taking it one step at a time, hopefully on an accelerated time scale. I would like to see these starting to be introduced in the next month or two. You've estimated a cost of a dollar or five dollar a day. We won't know this, of course, until the product starts reaching the market. 
And for people who think a vaccine can replace all this, you don't see a vaccine available for hundreds of millions of people until when? Next year? Yeah, I think that a vaccine will come out, especially given the political pressure. We're seeing the political pressure that can be exerted over the FDA and CDC. Maybe the FDA less so, it's, it's unclear. But I think a vaccine will come out. I think that we have to take a very measured approach to understanding what exactly it means when it becomes available. First, it will be available in very limited quantities. Second, it very well might not do as good a job. This isn't going to be like a smallpox or a polio or a measles vaccine. This is going to be a vaccine that probably will perform more like a flu vaccine, which we all know isn't perfect by any stretch. And so it, I think vaccines are not going to be the real out here. I think that the, they can't be the exit, at least not this first iteration of them. And that's why I believe that these paper strip tests that could be delivered to everyone's home using currently available technology could be scaled by the federal government. These can actually take the place, essentially, of vaccine-derived herd immunity. These can create a different kind of herd immunity, like effect, where you actually suppress the virus at the population level, and then everyone becomes safer regardless of whether they're using these tests. In the same way that vaccines elicit herd immunity, I want to create a different kind of herd effect through these tests. But I, to answer the question bluntly, no, I don't believe that the vaccine is going to be our exit strategy, at least not within the next six months or so, and, and maybe not even you know, till mid or late next year. We've been talking to Dr. Michael Minna, who's assistant professor of epidemiology to Harvard School of Public Health. Thank you very much, doctor. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me on. We have been speaking with Harvard epidemiologist Michael Minna. We will link to his work at ralphnadiradiohour.com. I want to thank our guests again, Robert H. Frank and Michael Minna. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up. We'll have a little bit more with each of our guests. A transcript of this show will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website soon after the episode is posted. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when we welcome Barbara Fries, author of Industrial Strength Denial, Eight Stories of Corporations Defending the Indefensible from the Slave Trade to Climate Change. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. It's a great book. Looking forward to interviewing Barbara Fries. Hi, this is Jimmy Lee Wirt, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, and welcome to the wrap-up. First, Ralph challenges Professor Frank about motorcycle helmets. Now, you do show a sensitivity to cultural resistance in this country to taxation that doesn't exist at that level in a lot of other countries. But on page 26 of your book, there's a really curious example of your indulging libertarian impulses. In most Western countries, you ride a motorcycle, you have to wear a helmet, period. It's mandatory. And what you say in your book is you would permit someone who wants to ride with the wind in his hair to pay a modest annual fee for a medallion that when affixed to his cycle would entitle him to ride legally without a helmet, unquote. In other words, if you want to ride legally without a helmet, you have to pay a fee. Why did you do something like that when almost all countries that we relate to in a comparative sense just say, hey, you know, you want to drive a motorcycle? You got to wear a helmet. Yeah, you you don't like that example, and my wife didn't like it either. <laughs> Maybe I need to rethink it, but here, here's the idea. There are people for whom riding with the wind in their hair is the defining experience of owning a motorcycle. Those people, if they care strongly enough about it, would be willing to pay a fee in order to continue to have the right to do that. If they ride without a helmet, they cause harm to others. One of my sons was almost killed in a bike accident. He survived because he was wearing a bike helmet, which was by then required by law in New York State for everybody under 18. What a great law that was. I was so, so grateful for that law having been in effect that he survived that accident. But nothing magic happens to you when you get above 18. You make stupid decisions, even as adults. There are lots of people who won't wear a helmet because they would look dorky if they wore a helmet. So if you don't wear a helmet, you make other people feel more self-conscious if they wear one. And so 
we want to have people wearing a helmet, but we don't absolutely have to have everybody wearing a helmet. If people feel strongly enough about it, I say, let them compensate for the harm they do by not wearing one by paying a fine. Well, they do harm to others as well. They do harm to people who have to clean up after them. They do harm that neurosurgeons can describe in a ghastly way. And the important thing is, this is a very easy mandate to enforce because, yeah. you know, they're going down the highway in the road. They don't have a helmet. They get citation. I don't understand why you went to the extreme level of one of our former interns, Mr. Viscusi. That's not a hill I want to die on, my dear. But, <laughs> okay. but the guy who gets killed in a motorcycle accident doesn't collect a nickel of Social Security, doesn't get any of the hundreds of thousand dollars we spend on end-of-life care under the Medicare program. It's the same with smoking. People said we need to regulate smoking because they impose costs on the government budget through health care. No. Smokers die younger. They die more quickly. They're a net government plus on the budget. So that's not the reason to regulate them. Okay, so that's the main uh, objection I have to your book. I call it lethal <laughs> economic thinking. Okay. Uh, the issue is to have a social order where common sense, common humanity resolves the problem. And now Ralph expounds on the legacy of prohibition. What I sense what you're doing is you're carefully calibrating levels of popular resistance or acceptance depending on the kinds of products. And I think that's a pretty intelligent way to approach it because decades ago, as we all know, alcoholism was a terrible problem, breaking up families, and led by women who were tired of what happened to them when drunken husbands came home, they started a prohibition movement and they got a constitutional amendment about 100 years ago prohibiting the production and sale of alcohol products. That produced the kind of crime that is still difficult to eradicate in this country in terms of contraband goods and networks, and it didn't work. And I remember that the great dean of Harvard Law School made a very important point that you might appreciate if you're not aware of it, Robert. We're talking to Professor Robert Frank, the author of a new book, Under the Influence, Putting Peer Pressure to Work. And he said, there are some things like addictions, you know, addiction to alcohol, mm -hmm. that are beyond the effective limits of legal action. And so when you're dealing with addictions, you can open up a whole range of variables. For example, I could say to you, as effective as a carbon tax advancing solar energy is low-priced labor in China, which is producing under horrendous labor conditions cheap solar panels that have displaced the U.S. industry and have flooded the country with exports, making it very economic for another industry to rise, installing solar panels for agreeable homeowners. How do you relate to all this? You know, it's it's been said you can't have socialism in one country. The problem is if you try to regulate something and nobody else does, there are workarounds of exactly the sort you talk about. So when we do trade agreements, what we try to do is incorporate labor protection clauses in them so that people can't hire labor under unacceptable conditions elsewhere and flood our market with goods that we couldn't possibly compete with because we try to maintain safer and, and, and more humane conditions within our borders. So yeah, that's a, that's a very real problem. But of course, the lower prices helped undercut the appeal of heating your home with oil or gas, right? Oh, there, yeah. That, that, and that's why it's such a difficult question to regulate. If the best opportunity someone has in another place is to make a product for a wage that's less than anybody would be willing to accept here, and if not making that product here would free us up to make something that's of even greater value than what we were making, then everybody wins from that. So we don't want to discourage that. But it's a fine line when, when it comes to workers working under inhumane or unsafe working conditions. We want to take some position that will use whatever influence we do have on other countries to get them to move in the direction of a more humane workplace. And now Steve and David get in on the action. Anyway, I want to give Steve and, and David a little time just to convey to you what they'd like to ask or what's on their mind. Sure. Yeah, just a short question because we are running out of time. Professor, 
Big controversy about masks, which seems kind of ridiculous. What is the better behavior to get peer pressure to have people wear masks? Is it just simply if you're walking down the street, you wear your mask and you see somebody not wearing a mask and you don't say anything? Or is it you say to somebody as you wear your mask, hey, where's your mask? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Uh, I don't think we have a clear answer to it. But what we do know is that if you wear a mask, everyone else becomes more likely to wear one. We talk about the tribal antagonisms that exist, but no matter which side you're on, even if you're on the side that has for odd reasons decided that wearing a mask is not the right thing to do against all current evidence, seeing enough other people wearing a mask will induce more of those people to wear masks too. So it, it's really, it ought to be non-controversial. The, what if the, the government posted pictures of people who aren't wearing masks, if there were a website, and instead of getting a citation, you were just photographed without the mask on and it was uploaded to a public shaming website? Yeah, without saying whether we should or shouldn't do that, I would make a descriptive prediction that if the government did do that, many more people would wear masks. What about mandating it? This is an emergency, an epidemic, it's contagion. It isn't like a, a dental cavity. What about governors who are now moving toward mandating masks in, in more and more circumstances? We have a mandate in New York State. Governor Cuomo imposed one, and it, it was, under the circumstances, exactly the right move. I mean, I, I think the libertarians are on very shaker ground here. They would never claim that they have a right to do whatever they want, no matter how much harm it causes to other people. So they wouldn't say, oh, I, I feel like swinging my fist into your nose. I have a right to do what I want. No. John Stuart Mill's harm principle says that the state can tell you no to prevent undue harm to other people. And the science has now become clear that wearing a mask makes other people less likely to become infected with a virus that could kill them. So I think it's totally within the legitimate scope of state action to say, while this epidemic is in full swing, people must wear a mask when they're in certain circumstances where they're in a position to infect others. Well, we've run out of time. We've been talking with Professor Robert Frank of Cornell University. He's the author of the book, Under the Influence, Putting Peer Pressure to Work. I don't think we've done full justice to your contents, Professor Frank. You have a chapter called Smoking, Eating, and Drinking, another chapter called Trust, another chapter called The Sexual Revolution Revisited, another chapter called The Climate Crisis, which we discussed a bit, and a chapter called Creating More Supportive Environments. Just one last quick question. How would you apply this contagion issue to political movements supporting different candidates? If you were in politics and you were a political advisor and you want to get more supporters? Yeah, you definitely want people to communicate with one another about what they're doing. And so I think when we see gifts acknowledged, it makes a huge difference if that's done in a way that people see that their neighbors have taken a step at some cost to themselves to promote an idea that they care about. So I, I think you can't be influenced by what you don't see. The solar panel research shows that if the panels are on the back of the house, they don't have nearly as strong a contagion effect as if they're out front where people can see them. So if you do something that you think you want others to see and, and be influenced by, try to do it in, in the most public way. A lot of people don't like virtue signaling, so rather than call attention to the good thing you've done, call attention to a good thing that a friend or a neighbor has done. It's interesting the difference between politics and the consumer economy, because we're told now that it's almost impossible to change 90% of the voters' minds over a four-year period between supporting Republican Trump and the Democratic Biden or their nominee, and that the battle is for only 6 to 10% of the undecided voters. Why do you think contagion is so rigid in the political area? Because certainly not that rigid, given look at the dramatic changes in the drop in the number of adult smokers in this country from about 50% in the 1960s to about 16% now. 
Well, that that's a, a great example because, you know, I had a friend who was a heroin addict. He said it was much harder to quit cigarette smoking than it was for him to quit heroin. We would not have seen a drop like we've seen in the smoking rate, except for the contagion factor on top of the price effect. The price effect by itself would never have gotten us there. And I think in the case of political cohesion, the more strongly wedded you are to a, a tribe's view, the more it takes to pick you off from that. But even there, once things start to unravel, they can unravel almost overnight. Nobody predicted the fall of the Soviet Union when it happened, except for the two cranks that it predicted it every year for 20 years. It fell country by country within the span of 18 months because once some people spoke out, it became safer for others to speak out. If you look at the Republican senators who are silent about Trump, maybe they'll remain silent about him going forward. But if enough speak out, others will find it less costly to speak out as well. And then we could see a snowball there, too. Finally, a little more with Dr. Michael Minna. Are you encouraged by the report of the vast SUNY university system in New York State, which says that it has developed a pool saliva test for its thousands of students developed by the SUNY scientists and applied by SUNY? Uh, so for surveillance efforts, I think pooling is a very powerful tool. And I've also, my lab has published some protocols for that as well. So I am encouraged about the use of that as a surveillance tool. But this is the, that type of effort, there's still going to be a delay. You're not going to have results back in 15 minutes. They still have to go to a laboratory. And so I think that's a good step forward. It's a step to really increase the efficiency of our tests. And especially given that we have limited resources at the moment in terms of the supply chain. So that is one avenue. And it's going to be a good avenue for things like universities that actually have laboratories to work with. But for the average individual, they probably won't have access to that kind of frequent testing like a university might. So I think we need to see both of these happening in tandem. Are you recommending that for Harvard University? Yes, I am. I think um, both pooling or if uh, a place like Harvard, you know, we actually have enough resources that we can partner with labs that are on the Harvard campus, essentially, and MIT campus, and just do actual diagnostic testing of everyone every few days. But that's not reasonable as a true public health measure. That's something that, you know, if you are at a school with a $50 $50 billion endowment or whatever it is, you know, that these schools can pull this off. And even smaller schools, liberal arts schools in the Northeast, for example, can, can do this type of testing. But the average, the average county in the United States won't be able to, to do that sort of testing. Do you think that's the way China is controlling its pandemic? It seems to have returned to normal economic and social life, festivals, gatherings, markets. Did they do it by massive testing? They did it. It wasn't such, it wasn't the kind of massive testing that I'm referring to. They did it by closing things down very strictly and testing, contact tracing. And also they have a very, their, their society is very used to wearing masks. It, culturally, it's extremely acceptable and everyone's are doing it right away. I think that we can, for example, we've seen a lot of places in the Northeast have actually largely gotten this virus under control when they, with social distancing, economic shutdown, masks. Now, I think economic shutdown is a very, it, it's really walking a fine edge. I'm worried about the larger consequences to society. And, you know, those could potentially be worse than the, if not done properly, those could be worse than the virus itself in the long run. That's how other countries have done it. The difference in the United States is there has been a general unwillingness if you will, to participate in really being strict about things like social distancing and mask wearing in a lot of this country. And it's because we continue to have major cases and outbreaks burning in much of the country that those places will continue seeding new infections into places that largely have gotten it under control. And so as long as any outbreaks are are burning in any places that tend to mix frequently with with another place, then then no places are safe. So I think that we need to either change society's habits and get people to actually wear masks very routinely whenever they go out and social distance, and hopefully we can get the whole prevalence down. But that unfortunately hasn't seemed to work thus far. And I think these tests are a different approach. Before we conclude, anything else you want to tell our listeners? Listeners want to get a compressed version of what Dr. Mine is talking about his op-ed was in the July 3rd, 2020 
New York Times. Any last thoughts? No, I, I think the only last thoughts I'd have is if you find that this is seems to make sense, if you go read the op-ed or from this program, feel free to reach out to your local representatives. Congressmen and senators know about this effort, and they're, you know, I think it can only benefit if you get in touch with them and say that you know, you're supportive of a change in how we're trying to tackle this. And I think that it, it turns out grassroots efforts can go a, a long way here. Indeed. And that's a wrap. Join us next week when we speak to Barbara Fries, author of Industrial Strength Denial, Eight Stories of Corporations Defending the Indefensible from the Slave Trade to Climate Change. Until next time. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting ready.